day two of second Asian symposium on cellular automata technology. Yesterday we had two sessions. Uh, first session was the beauty of cellular automata and second session essentially started with the technical talks. But today we will be having two keynote sessions and two uh, technical sessions, paper presentations mainly. Our first keynote session is by Professor Deepak Dhar, and which will be chaired by uh, our own professor in Department of Physics, Professor Krishnandu Mukherjee. Uh, I just introduce Professor Deepak Dhar here. Professor Deepak Dhar is a renowned theoretical physicist who is widely res respected research on statistical physics and Dhar graduated in science from the University of Allahabad in 1970 before earning a master's degree in physics from the IIT Kanpur in 1972. He secured his PhD degree from uh, California Institute of Technology in 1978. Professor Dhar's interest is in statistical physics. He has worked in the area of fractals, self-organized criticality, percolations and animal problems, and slow relaxation is in magnets and glasses. In 2022, he became the first ever Indian scientist to be chosen for the Boltzmann Medal, the highest recognition in statistical physics awarded once in every three years by IUPAP. Dhar has been awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2023. He is the winner of the TWAS Prize and also an elected fellow of the World Academy of Sciences. The Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the Apex Agency of the Government of India for Scientific Research, awarded Professor Dhar the Shanti Sharuf Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology, one of the highest Indian science awards for his contribution to physical sciences in 1991. Currently, he is a distinguished professor at the Department of Physics at Iser Pune. So uh, yesterday, we already have listened to some of his uh, discussions on different topics. But today, we'll be having a purely technical session from him. So uh, on behalf of the ASCET, I invite you once again, Professor Dhar here. And uh, over to Professor uh, Mukherjee for the session. Please, welcome. So uh, good morning, everybody. So it is our pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Deepak Dhar. He is the distinguished speaker of this particular session. Komlika has already mentioned uh, about his research and, and education. So uh, I'll request Professor Dhar to start his presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have already been introduced once before yesterday, so it is. Okay, yeah, this is more convenient. Right? Okay, can people hear me? Can people hear me? Okay, it's good. Okay, so uh, well, let me start by thanking the organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, meeting. And um, it was very interesting to learn about all kinds of different applications to which the cellular automata are now being used. Of course, I didn't understand everything, but still. It is um, very nice. I, so I will tell you about 
the cellular automata from a physicist perspective. And uh, so this is saying modeling physical systems with cellular automata. So there are systems in real life which we model. And uh, so the modeling, if you want to make it simple, turns out to be more or less a, a cellular automaton model. So that is how I got to this subject. I have studied some cellular automata in my research career, but I don't have any great feeling for the cellular automaton rules in general. I typically apply them to a specific problem and try to understand how that behaves. Anyway, so let us go on. So this is the outline. I will start with the introduction. I'll give you three examples of how cellular automatons can be used, have been used in, physicals, in physics for uh, modeling purposes. All these examples are actually from my own work. And then I will conclude. Question. Okay. So, I, so this is about the simple modeling. The world we live in is very complex and bewildering. For understanding, it is often useful to simplify the problem and get rid of inessential details. Then we get a more tractable problem whose understanding helps us get a better idea of the original problem as well. Okay. So the basic laws of physics are usually formulated in terms of partial differential equations. Okay, yeah. And further, yeah, okay, very good. Okay. Uh, in terms of partial differential equations, like the Maxwell equation, the Schrodinger equation, the Navier-Stokes equations. However, starting with these basic equations to predict the actual behavior of any system with many degrees of freedom is rather hard. Okay, So then it is useful to have an effective coarse grain description in which some effective interaction between these coarse grain degrees of freedom. So the objects which we discuss are not elementary particles. They are some kinds of groups of particles or agents or grains of sand or some such thing. And we think of them as a single um, degree of freedom. Or, you know, uh, maybe it has some spatial coordinates and stuff. Okay, so this is the way cellular automaton models are used in physics in general. So sometimes study of such simplified models is ridiculed as a physicist's spherical cow approximation. I'm sure all of you have heard of this thing. And uh, at least in my own work, people have sometimes said the same thing. They say, oh, you are studying some... Uh, toy model or uninteresting model or not sufficiently realistic model or some such thing. Useless to be precise. Okay. One should keep in mind the advantages and limitations of such modeling all the time. Okay. So for example, in the original problem of the spherical cow, the question was posed like this, that there is an Arab Emir and he had a stable of horses and he wanted to you know give them the best food possible so he employed some technical people who will decide how much food to give and a physicist was asked to find out how much food should be given to a horse and so he said that you know as far as physicists are concerned horse can be taken to be um, a sphere because they have a mass and uh, they generate heat and I would, you know, that in the end that decides how much energy you need per day. 
So if you want to calculate the daily food requirement of animal of a given size, so uh, food for a horse versus food for a goat, the ratio of these is pretty well determined by the spherical cow approximation. It is not so bad. It is not so stupid. Okay, one should not, um, you know, of course, say that a horse is a cow. Oh, sorry, horse is a sphere. That is stupid. But for our purpose, horse can be approximated by a sphere for the calculation I want to do. So I had just used this word spherical cow. And uh, one of the students pointed out that he didn't know. This is the first time the justification for the spherical cow approximation is being given. So I'm giving it to you, you know, just so that you will also know what is a spherical cow actually. Okay. So in this talk, I will try to illustrate this process of simplification, abstraction, and effective description in terms of coarse grain degrees of freedom by three examples. So, you know, all these things are very imp important. In each case, I will start with the physical phenomena and try to outline its salient features. You know, so you are given a physical phenomena. You have to identify the kinds of things you consider are critical things that you want to be able to address model. Okay, so these are the salient features. Then we construct a simple model in which this essay, which has the essential ingredient needed and not much else. And lastly, I will indicate how the simplified model is analyzed and the kinds of questions that can be answered using this analysis. So, of course, you know, quite often the analysis is tough and we will not actually give you the analysis that will, for each of these problems, it will take a whole lecture by itself. So I will just refer to the fact that it can be done, but um, that is, uh, you know, you can read up the original literature for finding details. Okay, so first let me start with self-organized criticality. So many extended, driven, open, dissipative, non-equilibrium systems in nature show steady states that have long-range correlation. So this is a very long sentence with many adjectives. Each of them is very important. So, you, you know, you have systems which are non-equilibrium systems. They are not in equilibrium and the physics of non-equilibrium systems is not so well developed. They have dissipation in them and there is some energy current which goes in and out. And so this is driven and open is more or less similar in this context. And extended means they have lots of degrees of freedom. And we want to understand these systems and quite often they show long-range correlations. Uh, so these systems, long-range correlations in equilibrium set MAC were known, but they occur only when you go to the critical point. And critical point requires fine-tuning. But in non-equilibrium systems, you can get to a critical point without fine-tuning. So these systems were said to be self-organized. They organize themselves to be at the critical point. And that is the word. So the examples of such systems are earthquakes, solar flares, neuronal activity in the brain, biological extinctions, and all these kinds of stuff. The idea is best illustrated by the paradigmatic example of a sand pile, which has served as the paradigm. So sand pile model. So consider a sand pile made by dropping dry sand slowly on a flat surface. So you get a pile like this. So what happens when you keep on adding sand? As we drop sand, initially the mass of the pile grows, but it saturates to a limiting mass and extra added mass slides off. So we are looking now at the steady state of a pile in which we keep on adding sand and sand keeps on going off. In this steady state of the pile, the shape of the pile is roughly conical with magnitude of slope of the surface at each point is roughly constant. So that is called the angle of repose. So now if you drive the sand pile slowly by adding a grain at a time, what happens is 
that the steady state of the same file, sometimes the added grain just goes and sits at the point of addition. At other times, it may cause an instability and results in a you know, few particles going off, or then those particles may cause further instability and more go off. And so it causes a small or big avalanche. Okay. So the key point which I want to stress here, there is a steady drive, you keep on adding at a constant rate, but the relaxation occurs in erratic bursts of wide range of sizes. So while the drive is steady and constant, the relaxation is very burst-like and irregular. And this is shown in this picture here, x-axis is the time, y-axis is the number of grains falling off the pile. If in a particular model, but let's not go into the details of that. So you see, sometimes there is a lot of stuff, sometimes there is nothing falling off. And the sizes of these things can vary from 1 to 100 in this simple example. OK? So similar response is seen in earthquakes and rain and things like that. So in earthquake, what happens is there are continental plates which press against each other. And as they press, they move at constant rate nearly. So the pressure built in the stress on the rocks builds up at a steady rate. But the relaxation of stress occurs in burst-like events, which are called um, earthquakes. And these are um, the intensity of earthquake can be small or big and can be very, very big. And of course, we would like to know, you know, how often do big earthquakes occur and all these kinds of stuff. And these things, of course, have long range correlations because if an earthquake occurs, you can feel it in Japan and also you can feel it in India, Mongolia, or, you know, it's thousands of kilometers across, sometimes across the whole globe. Okay, sorry, I beg your pardon. All these systems have slow drive and local threshold relaxation and possibilities of growing avalanches. In rain, what happens is that water evaporates from the oceans to the atmosphere. Then it has to come out of the atmosphere, but that occurs in rain. And rain is an infrequent event. For many days, there is no rain. Sometimes there is some rain here or there. You know, so it's a patchy relaxation. And people would like to understand how the statistics of rain occurs. And these kinds of theories can help to explain that kind of a phenomena. So right now, the only thing we are focusing on is burst-like relaxations. OK. So now I make a cellular automaton model of sand piles. We consider a square grid of size L by L. At each side, there is a known negative integer zi, which gives the number of grains at that side. The sites will be, we said, you know, if the heights is 0, 1, 2, 3, they are said to be stable. So now, if the height becomes more than 3, then that site is said to be unstable. And what we say is that if the site is unstable, a toppling occurs. And toppling occurs, then one grain is transferred to each of the neighbors. So the number of grains at that site decreases by 4, and one grain is transferred to each neighbor. Now, if the toppling occurs, so if you transfer to the neighbor, that site may now become unstable, and that will cause it to topple, and then it will throw out grain, which we may make other sites also unstable. And so, you know, there is a possibility that you can have a very big event. On the other hand, sometimes you add a grain, it may just go and sit at one place, and there may not be any avalanche whatsoever. So if a toppling occurs at the boundary side, grains are transferred outside and they, they are lost. So that is the dissipation part. You keep on adding grains, they keep on getting lost. There is a steady state and there is a burst-like relaxation. So this is illustrated here in a very simple 3 by 3 lattice. Uh, you start with some heights, you keep on adding here, then it becomes 4. 4 is unstable. So this throws out particles, this becomes 0. But these two become 4-4, four, four, then these have to topple. This on toppling throws out one particle to the right, one to the right. This becomes unstable. And uh, eventually, you get a stable configuration again. Now you will add another grain. And uh, you know then you, it may cause toppling, it may not cause toppling. And you keep on evolving like this. 
Okay, so that is the simple model. So we start with a stable configuration of the pile, add one grain at randomly chosen site. If that is stable, do nothing. If it's unstable, we topple at the site, transfer the grain to the one or more neighboring sites. These are also toppled, and then there are, till there are no unstable sites left. At this point, we add another grain. We keep adding like this and study the irregular activity in the steady state of the sand pile. And this activity looks like this for this is for a hundred by hundred lattice. Okay, theoretical analysis. So that's the model, that's the definition of the model. How can we study it? It turns out that the theoretical analysis of this model requires or uses the abelian property, which says suppose you have a configuration with more than one unstable sites. Then you can topple at first this one and then this one, or first this one and then this one, and you get the same configuration, which may still be unstable, in which case you can again choose to topple in whichever direction you want. And, uh, and you know, you keep on toppling, but the order in which you choose to topple sites does not matter. So using this commutativity property of toppling repeatedly, it follows that for any stable configuration C, adding a grain at any site I and relax, and then add at any site J and relax, we get the same configuration if we added the grains in the reverse order. So now we define an operator AI, which says, take the space of stable configurations. AI is an operator and C is the configuration. AI C is a new configuration. It's obtained by adding at site i and relaxing. And then this AI AJC start with C, add at i and relax, and then, sorry, add at j and relax, then add at i and relax. It's the same result if you add it in different order. And so this is the equation. But since it holds for all configurations C, we just write AI AJ is equal to AJ AI. So these operators, commute with each other. So if you think of these as matrix operators, apply on a configuration, it goes to a new configuration, right? So these are 0, 1 matrices, and uh, they commute with each other. And that's a very remarkable property. So in addition, these operators satisfy also additional relations. So if you add four particles at one site, then whatever be the initial configuration there, it will become unstable. And it will be equivalent to adding one particle at each of the neighbors. So this says ai to the power 4 is equal to product over j, aj, where product is over the four neighbors of site i. At the boundary, there are fewer neighbors, and you know that is how the relation goes. So these two equations actually, this ai aj equal to aj ai, and these equations too define a set. Algebra is satisfied by these operators A, and this is a semi-group under multiplication. But so you, if you multiply a lot of A's, one of you know, you start with the configuration, add something, add something, that's A1, A2, A7, A20. Then you can take this string of A's which you multiply, and then you can commute them and uh, put all the powers of A1 at one place. But if this power is more than 4, you can reduce the power by using this reduction rule. Because bigger powers can be converted to smaller powers. And uh, so then, this semi-group can actually be shown to be a finite abelian group acting on the set of recurrent configurations of the same pile. And then, using this group structure, one can deduce quite simply several properties of the sand pile. These I will not explain in great detail, but it says that only a very small set of stable configurations are actually recurrent, which occur again and again in the system. And these occur with equal probability. The two-point function gij, which is defined as the expected number of toplings at j when I add at i, can be calculated exactly. This is a response function. You add something, and this perturbation, how much effect it has on some other side j. For the directed version of the sand pile, you can actually calculate 
all the critical exponents of avalanches in all dimensions. However, for the undirected model on the square lattice, and this model is partly solved, but not fully, and you know, people still don't know the critical exponents of avalanches in this model, even after so many years over. Okay, so the model is not fully solved. Okay, so now let me consider a slightly different problem. <clears throat> Consider a disturbance propagating in an homogeneous medium where the medium affects the wave and the wave modifies the medium. Okay, so for example, in earthquakes, there is the shock wave which moves, but as it moves, it changes the medium because the rocks are sometimes their properties change because of the shock wave has gone through, or epidemics because there is a um, wave of epidemics which goes through a population, but the people who are left behind, their immunity levels are affected by the fact that they have been affected once. So it may go up or it may go down depending on the particular type of infection. But anyway, if you have these kinds of phenomena in which there are waves which are moving around, but they modify the medium, then after some time the wave comes back again, and but it encounters a changed medium. And so there is a self-interaction between the previous thing and new infection, which is, provides a long-term memory in the system, which is uh, non-trivial. So such a system shows long-term long memory. And as the wave encounters the medium, then it returns. The eulerian Walker model is a very simple cellular automaton model to study this phenomenon. OK, its historical roots are in the Langton ant model. As a, so I, this is a cellular automaton meeting, so I'm sure a large number of you know the Langton Ant model. So those of you who don't know, so let me just say that it's a two-dimensional Turing machine. So there is some head, reading head, which is um, called an ant. And depending on what is there and its internal state, it moves to one of the neighbors. Then it reads the new head. And then, depending on its state, it can change the character written there and move to the nearest neighbor and so on. It keeps on going. It's just a two-dimensional Turing machine. But depending on the rules of evolution, and uh, we will take very special rules. So this is the definition of the model. A model may be defined on general graphs, but for simplicity, again, let us take L by L square lattice with periodic boundary conditions. At each side, there is an arrow that points in the direction towards one of the four neighbors. So there are four neighbors at each side on a square lattice. There is an arrow at each side which points in the direction of one neighbor. In the initial state, the direction of each arrow is specified. You tell where is each arrow in the beginning. Now the walker starts at the origin and performs a deterministic walk using the following rule. When it arrives at a site, it rotates the arrow 90 degree clockwise or anti-clockwise, whichever way you like, but fixed, let's say anti-clockwise, 90 degrees, and then moves to the site in the new direction of the arrow. Then it goes to a new site, then it rotates the arrow there and moves in the direction of the arrow and it keeps on walking like this. Okay, that's as simple as this. But as it is moving along, it is modifying the medium. Okay, that's the key point which we have kept. So here, there is a simple picture. You start here, then uh, you will rotate this, no? So 90 degrees, then you come here, then you rotate this 90 degrees, you go there, and you rotate this 90 degrees, you come back here. But this arrow has now gone here, so it will come back here, and then it will go back to the origin. So, you know, you can evolve and you can check what happens. In this particular case, the position, if you start at 0, 0, first you will go to 1, 0, then 1, then you get to 1, 0, then you will get back to 0, 0, then you will get back to go to 0, 1, and so on and so forth. Okay? So what happens if you keep on evolving it like this? If you start with the random configurations of arrows and start at the origin, it's very interesting. The walker keeps on coming back to the origin very often, but the region explored by it keeps on growing with time. And this is a picture of how the region explored by it varies. And what is done here is different colors show 
how often a site has been visited. So these sites have been visited very, very often and the next one is one level less and next one is one level less and so on. Okay. So after 10 to the power 7 steps, different, you know, that's how the picture looks and can we understand the structure. So now I briefly tell you what is the theoretical analysis. As the set of configurations available to the system is finite, eventually the system will come back to original state and, and it will go into a cycle. Okay, this much is clear. The interesting point is normally you would expect the cycle length to be very big. I think there were lots of talks about cycle lengths in Markov chains before. This is one of them. And uh, but it turns out that in this case the period is actually very short. It's exactly equal to 4L squared. And this period is independent of the initial configuration. Whatever configuration you pick, it will end up in a cycle of length 4L squared. Uh, and uh, in this periodic orbit, each bond of the lattice is transversed exactly once in each direction. It's an interesting, amazing result. And uh, even more remarkable, is the fact that this property holds for arbitrary simple undirected graphs. This justifies the nomenclature because Euler circuits are the circuits where each, you know, a Walker pro goes through, but it visits each bond. Okay, so, so this is the Eulerian Walkers. So one can consider a sand pile variation of this model. One considers open boundaries, the Walker. So here, the walker keeps on going round and round and it um, goes into a cycle. But you can consider a sand pile like variation where if it goes to a boundary, then it can leave. Once it leaves, then we add some other walker at some other place and let it walk until it leaves. You know, so it, so one can start with these kinds of stuff. And again, you can define addition operators. Take a configuration, add a walker at site i and let it relax and new configuration of arrows is the new stable configuration. And then uh, it turns out that these operators, addition operators, also satisfy the abelian property and the same closure equations um, which we wrote before. These ones, a to the power 4 is equal to um, product of a. So you have two different models, very different models, but they have the same abstract group structure. Okay. So the this Eulerian Walker model was independently discovered by James Prop, who was interested in studying random walks on graphs. And uh, so if you take random walks on graphs, and he wanted to estimate using Monte Carlo techniques the probability that this walker will reach at this box starting at site i will reach site j in time at time t. And this you can do in Monte Carlo, just start many times and then see what happens. He wanted to reduce the variance of the estimate of the probability of transition from x to y in time t. And uh, so instead of saying that, you know, you can go randomly anywhere, he said that if you sample all the directions with equal probability or equally often, then you will do better. And he tried it and it seems to work. And this is the model he came up with. So the variance can be reduced by changing the dynamics to Eulerian rules. That was his motivation for studying this problem. So more generally, the Eulerian Walker's problem is considered a prototypical model of de-randomization. So in computer science, we know that there are lots of algorithms, a lot of problems, which are very hard problems, like NP-complete problems. However, for these problems, often there is a random algorithm which is pretty good. Okay, so people study these random algorithms, but then it was realized that all these random algorithms can be converted into a non-random algorithm that is called de-randomization. And uh, 
so you can construct a deterministic de-randomized algorithm because the de-randomized algorithms are easier to analyze theoretically. So however, the kinds of questions of interest to physicists are usually about long time steady states, which may not be of immediate interest in computer science. So I don't think computer scientists will want to keep on evolving some stuff until it, um, samples, it comes back to the same place many, many times, right? So questions are somewhat different, but at least the initial model is very similar. And some of the analysis, um, some of the results we use can be obtained from this kind of structure. Okay, so now I want to discuss a uh, third problem, uh, which is called calving of glaciers. So I'm sure that these words are not familiar to you. So glaciers, of course, are frozen rivers, but they are frozen on top, but there is liquid below which makes them move. Okay. So they go to the sea. Near the sea, there is um, water in the sea, which is um, liquid, but the ice is here. So the, the warmer water kind of tries to liquefy and it breaks, cracks up cracks appear in the ice sheets and uh, these cracks then fall into the sea and uh, then uh, you know more cracks appear and the thing keeps on flowing but the rate at which this ice flows into the sea is very important in the current age of climate change because uh, you know how much ice from the poles goes into the sea determines how the sea level rise. And it is very important that, you know, the rise should not occur too soon, otherwise Kolkata will be underwater. Okay, so there was a paper published in Nature Geoscience called Termini of Calving Glaciers, a self-organized critical system. Termini are just the terminus points of the glaciers. And calving is, you know, giving birth to babies. So, you know, that uh, glacier gives rise to babies. Okay, so here, what these people did, was well, they took some ice sheet and they had a very complicated model of cracks which develop in the ice sheet. And um, then you, you study these cracks and, you know, they, this whole thing can fall down in one go. The typical size of these uh, rocks of ice, ice, icebergs which fall into the sea can go from 10 meters to 100 meters or uh, uh, kilometer in size. So a six big chunk of ice of the size of one kilometer across will fall into the sea in one go. Okay, and when we would like to know the probability of such events or the average rate and so on. So, so I would like to consider now uh, simplifying the model of Calvin. So we consider a two-dimensional ice sheet. And so you take x, y space, but x is bigger than zero. So on the left there is c, on x bigger than zero is ice. Cracks are initiated at the boundary of the sheet. Then they move in the direction parallel to the boundary with random transverse displacements. So cracks appear because of contact with the water and they move parallel to the boundary. That is what is observed, but there is a little bit of transverse displacement. There is a small probability of tip splitting because one crack can become two cracks. Okay. And there is also a possibility of crack merger. Two cracks can come together and they become one crack. So we will say that when two cracks meet, they merge with probability one. However, when cracks are moving, they just move diffusively in transverse direction. <coughs> but that's with a small probability, the cracks develop. Okay, so these are the events, probability of um, one crack coming from the left becoming two cracks becomes probability lambda and otherwise it goes up or down with equal probability on a square lattice. 
And so here, this is the picture. You have this, initially there are these four cracks. Each of these cracks does a work. Sometimes it breaks into two and each part does a work. And uh, sometimes these cracks merge and like that. And as they merge, you know, so then these things form, which are uh, separated blocks of ice and they will fall into the sea because these are seas on the left. So all these things on the left will keep on falling into the sea and we would like to know the sizes of these fragments. Okay, so it's a model of fragmentation of ice sheet into small fragments. And this is the model the result of a simulation. You, you know, you start with some things and they keep on going. And this is an actual picture of the, from, uh, in near Sweden, there is a place called Svalbard. And you can take pictures from top. And this is the picture taken and you can see these cracks. And I would say that the model is a fairly, that you have to judge, but I, I'm saying that uh, this seems pretty good. So now, so in this model, what we can do is we can determine the distribution of sizes of these uh, fragments in this simple model. Okay, the result is some airy function, but let's not get into that detail just now. So we discussed three examples of cellular automaton models, sand pile model, oil area and workers, and fragmentation of a sheet. In each case, the model captures some key features of the system being modeled. But it ignores many details. It perhaps does not look very realistic, but I, I'll, I'll try to argue that it is not necessarily a bad thing. So people have argued that you look at the sand pile model, the real sand doesn't behave like this. So if you actually measure with great precision the distribution of sizes of avalanches in real sand, they are not the same as in this model. That is pretty well established experimentally. The theoretical value of the exponents is not known, but experiments seem to diverge from whatever theoretical estimates there are. Okay, so it's not realistic, but it captures the basic phenomena that we were trying to look at, and it helps understand something. So the model was designed to be analytically tractable, bad spelling, and the solution gives us some insight into the origin of the phenomena. Also, the model often shares features with other models with of very different phenomena and thus gives us a deeper understanding of the underlying unity. So, for example, you know, we started with this Eulerian Walkers. I didn't know that it's going to become a model of de-randomization in algorithm, which is a very different subject. But the same model is applicable or helps explain something else as well somewhat. And so that is the main point about this is that uh, the same model can be used to study many different phenomena. And uh, it helps explain the underlying unit. So sometimes one says that the study of such models is interesting per se. That's a tricky word, because when you say something is interesting to study per se, it, it means that I like to study this and don't ask me why. And that is not good enough, I think. If you are asking for funding from the government, you should be able to justify yourself a bit better. And the explanation is that this should be understood to mean something that while the model may not describe any specific system in good detail, it studies rewarding and helps improve our understanding of many related problems and their interconnections. Okay, and that is where I will stop. And I can take some questions if needed. Do the microscopic details really matter in describing the macroscopic physics? 
Okay, so this point is actually important. So suppose I want to understand uh, this gracious. Yeah. Suppose I want to understand something like gracious. So I'm hoping that there is a general theory of these things possible. Then the glaciers in um, North Pole are the similar to the glaciers in the South Pole are similar to the glaciers in Himalayas. That is a universality. If this universality is not there, then it is much harder to, you will have to have a theory for each uh, separate system. So when we look at Himalayan glaciers versus the polar glaciers, of course they are not similar fully. But if you look at only some features, then those features will look somewhat similar. So I am saying that the universality is partly there and it's partly by choice. And you can always find something which is not the same here and there. On the other hand, you can find things which are actually similar. So the universality is our way of looking at stuff. And uh, so we hope that the phenomena we are trying to study does have the description that I'm providing. If it turns out that it doesn't work, then I will change my model. Does it sound similar, just violation of scaling argument? So yeah. it looks a similar argument. Yeah, 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 of course. So the point is that if it happened, that all the critical phenomena in benzene and in toluene and in hydrogen were all different, then there will be no theory of critical phenomena. The fact that we have a theory is contingent on the fact that there is a degree of universality in the system we are studying. Otherwise, it will be very hard to study the um, systems. Okay, And uh, so, a, you have to actually identify which things are common in the problem being studied. Then focus on those problems and then hopefully there is a limited universality. So, for example, when people talk of universality, they say look at the critical exponents and don't look at anything else. Because if you look at anything else, they will not be universal. Right? So we choose to look at quantities which are similar in different systems and then call them universal. It's a selection effect at some level. It's also required for a general theory to exist. Otherwise, you have to say that every phenomena is different, no general theory is possible. Then theoretical physicists should do something else, you know, they should not do physics. So you said that there is a transfer of, uh, I mean, transfer of some energy from wave to medium, and that means that it's modified. So is it similar to Landau damping or? Uh, so I have not used these words, but of course there are some similarities. But you know, people you normally say Landau theory gives wrong exponents or something or the other. Okay, so okay, it gives wrong exponents. It provides some kind of a theoretical description. You can improve on that description and uh, get a better theory. At this level of discussion, I don't want to get into technical details of the Landau theory of phase transitions. But I'm saying that the very fact that there is a possibility of some general theory of phase transitions was appreciated by Landau or van der Waals or whoever. And so th that's, the, that's the first key observation is that there is some universe generality of all these different phenomena have some common features. You identify those common features and look at them. Right? Afterwards, if you are sort of studying um, critical phenomena for many years, you even forget the fact that there is life outside critical exponents. The two systems are not identical. You're only focusing on the stuff which are actually similar. Is it something like the, the massive mode? So that's why you basically... Uh, again, this occurrence of a massive mode is also 
in matter of why am I looking at messy modes? I can look at anything I want. And there are all these particles which collide with each other. They give rise to 30 other particles in the process of collision. So where is the massive mode there? You know, it's a theoretical prejudice to look at these things. And we should do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. But I think one should realize that it's a choice we are making of the way of description. OK? So. No, it's very general. Sir, I have a question that can we monitor the glacier by using spectral indexes? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, can, we, can we monitor the glacier hmm. using uh, spectral indexes? Yeah, so people have tried to do this. You know, of course, this is an important problem in the context of climate change studies. And so people actually have spent a lot of time for five years, 15 years, they keep on watching the glaciers and see there. What happens is that you can take aerial pictures. So you get cross-section area. But there is also a depth of the iceberg, which keeps on varying, which is very hard to estimate. So how much water goes into the sea depends on the volume of the iceberg, not on the cross-section area or some such thing. Those are actually very hard to study. And uh, not so much is known about them. And it's not clear how you will go around estimating them observationally. So even for studies which, uh, you know, these people have done, Astrom et al., they collect data for five, ten years, and uh, only on one or two locations. And so the total amount of data available on these kinds of stuff is limited. And uh, there is some degree of extrapolation involved in trying to apply them for realistic applications. Okay. If I really want to estimate what is the rate at which ice is going into the sea, that model perhaps will not be able to do this for you fully. Actually, spectral index can be used for early warning system. Spectral indexes can be used for early warning system. Yeah. So, uh, so if it can happen, that will be the best for our livelihood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so of course for glaciers, people don't use early warning system because nobody lives on those icebergs. But in earthquakes, people would like to have an early warning system. And uh, as you perhaps know, it is not yet there. There is no early warning system. For typhoons, you can get early warning. For earthquakes, there is no early warning possible. Okay. It doesn't seem uh, likely that it will happen in the next few years. Uh, since my, I just have a few minutes, but I'm trying to point out the fact that there is a model, but there is a real life application and there are very different quite often. If I know the distribution of sizes of earthquakes, okay, and I know that a major earthquake is going to happen in the Bombay region in the next 10 years, magnitude 8 even. What will I do as an expert administrator? What are the policy options available to you to say if you have some likelihood of a major earthquake in next 10 years? Not much you can do really because you know you cannot vacate the city. It's just not possible. Uh, change all the housings to make them strong. Not feasible. <laughs> You know, things like that. So the application requires much more detailed study and much better understanding. I guess in some systems, you can do some uh, control. In other systems, not much control is possible. And you just have to mitigate and do whatever is uh, the case. No? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So, is this uh, the theory is uh, uh, the 
is this theory applicable for general system or, or particular so what happens is that the Eulerian work is not a random work it's a deterministic work because the guy once comes here there is a rule which which way it will go however if you start with a random background of arrows in the beginning then the motion of the walker looks random to the eye so there is a pseudo randomness in the walk not a real randomness and that is that's the point of it you know it's de-randomized but it acts like random okay if you didn't know all the orientation of i beg your pardon when everything is broken down Uh, here also. Okay, so I even forgot what I was trying to say. Yeah, so th there is a randomness, but the origin of this randomness is in the initial configuration of the arrows, which you don't, you may not be able to observe always hidden um, data. Okay. Maybe there are few online questions. Okay. The first one is from Canada Yeah. Very interesting talk. Thank you. What is your opinion about quantum applications? Quantum application. I haven't thought too much about it. It turns out that some of these results are actually extendable to quantum random works. If, you know, there is some evolution operator. And uh, you can check if some of these properties can hold there. I haven't studied it very deeply, so I cannot make a much stronger comment. The send file model will not show any change if we apply asynchronous in terms of update pattern according to your talk. However, if we apply information loss in the system, is the system robust or not? Okay, so I guess if you have a sand pile and you are trying to model it, I don't know what is information loss. Just starting with the original model, what exactly is information loss when I'm just mm, playing with sand? The information is in the head of the beholder. It's not clearly in the system. You can sometimes say that there is an entropy or something, something. Yeah, I'm saying that all these ideas you can use. I'm not saying the concept is totally useless, but I'm just saying that one should be able to see what is meant by this. It requires deconvolution. If we apply the information loss to the system, is the system, if, I don't know if you apply the information loss, if there is dissipation in the system, I suppose there must be some information loss of some kinds of information. Quite often I didn't have the information in the beginning. So the question of loss doesn't arise. Okay. So generally we can think of it in loss in the steady state. Yeah. yeah. No, so I am saying that our aim was to say something non-trivial about the steady state of such driven systems. And I am saying that I think we are able to say something about them. And it may not be exactly everything that you wanted to know. And uh, maybe with more studies you can say a few more things a bit better. But maybe never everything. Okay. Yes, sir. Louder. Hmm. Yes. That is L cos L actually. Hmm. So, uh, like if you take the three dimensional system, hmm. that is, so it will be more visualized for the, like, uh, the model actually. Hmm. So, is it? Or is it not actually? So, so all the results for the second problem are valid in arbitrary dimensions. 
or general graphs. They don't even have to be a regular lattice. Okay, the sand pile model can also be defined in three dimensions, four dimensions, and uh, some of the phenology continues to hold. There is a steady state, there is burst like relaxation. Other details, sometimes one can calculate some details, some other details you cannot calculate in, in full glory. request on behalf of our uh, ASCET uh, professor to give a small token of appreciation to our session chair for sharing such an wonderful session. Thank you. So thank you Deepak sir and Krishna sir for this session. Your session, your, uh, Deepak sir, your session was ex wonderful we still have lots of questions maybe people were still raising hands but we'll be taking the questions after uh, during the tea break so we'll be uh, keeping you engaged but for the audience here there is a tea break for i guess around 30 minutes we'll be coming back exactly at 11 a.m and resume the next session okay thank you